Uh, hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a pleasant and satisfactory tea. Uh, let me begin the next session by inviting Dr. Subora to chair the session. Uh, Dr. Subora is a faculty member at the Department of Physics at IIT Hyderabad and has been working in the areas of non perturbative string and quantum field theory and quantum black holes. I request Subo sir to kindly take over the next session. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Welcome everyone to this uh, first scientific lecture for the National Science Day. Um, the speaker for this session um, barely needs an introduction is Professor Sunil Mukhi. Most of you probably are familiar with him, especially in the physics community. Professor Sunil Mukhi is a well-known high energy theoretical physicist, uh, specializing on quantum field theory, supersymmetry and superstring theory. Um, he is well known for his contribution in this field. He did his PhD from, let me give a short bio of him. He did his PhD from Stony Brook University and then went on to do a postdoc at the uh, Abdul Salam Institute of um, Abdul Salam Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. After that, since then, he's been at TIFR for 27 years. And in 2012, he moved to Isaac Pune. At TIFR, he has held uh, various positions, senior professor. Um, Dean of Graduate Studies and the Department Chair of the Department of Theoretical Physics at Isaac Pune. Uh, he joined the, the Department Chair and had been a Dean of Faculty. Um, he is a very well-known, uh, very gifted speaker, which is a rarity among the physics and you know physics community in general. He's an outstanding communicator of science, and he has been uh, decorated with the Shantanu Bhatnagar Award. Um, he is a member of all the um, majority of the um, science academies. Um, Indian Academy of Sciences, the uh, Indian National Science Academy, and the World Academy of Sciences. Um, so I'll hand it over to Professor Sunil Mukhi for his talk, which is titled The um, Social Benefits of Basic Science. Take over, Professor Mukhi. Thank you, Shubha. Uh, welcome, all of you. I can't see any of you. That's always a little discouraging for a speaker, um, but uh, that's how it has to be, I guess. Um, and uh, so I will uh, start. Let me start by sharing my screen. And you can tell me if it's visible. Okay. Uh, and I'm full screening it. Is this visible? Hello? Yes. It is? Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Oh, very good. Okay. Okay. So my talk is called the social relevance of basic science. Maybe uh, it's a excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, I mean, one sir, second. can you just swap the display, sir, on top? Ah, oh, you have to swap the. I'm sorry. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank is you. This better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, That's what I wanted to check. Huh? I know because it puts a. Uh, I don't. I'm not used to WebEx. That's my problem. Hmm? Okay. I got uh, got it now. So yeah, one, one announcement, uh, just for me, sorry, sorry about the interruption. One announcement is that um, there'll be a question session uh, right after the talk. So roughly there's um, it's 15 minutes of talk and then 10 minutes of question and answer. So please hold on to your questions till the end of the talk. Thank you. Actually, Shobo, I don't mind taking questions in between. I can pause once in a while for questions. Is that okay? Okay, then, then yeah, I'll, the speaker is yeah. fine with it. You can go ahead. Uh, I prefer that because, you know, if I don't know what the audience is thinking or as wants to know, then the talk kind of gets very dry. Anyway, I'll do my best. So here's the talk and let's get going. 
So there are some images and quotes that I've taken from here and there. That's a disclaimer. Okay. So uh, I prepared this talk um, with something in mind, uh, which is a concern about the way we think about science in the year 2022, or actually in the last 10 years, which are also, you know, the last 10 years of my official career as a scientist since I retired this year. And uh, I realized that my, the first decade of my career and the last decade, uh, so, well, obviously society has changed, but uh, a lot of things that society used to believe, uh, it doesn't seem to believe anymore. And I prepared this talk slightly to counter this trend and try to make an argument as powerful as I can for the way we used to think about basic science when I entered the field uh, and the excitement I felt at that time. Now, I'll start by noting that the way we live has undergone a major transformation during my career uh, and, uh, you know, the last, let's say, four decades. And of course, uh, that, you know, that's very good. Uh, what is not always appreciated is what kind of role basic science has played in this major transformation. And in this talk, I want to review some key examples, primarily from the 20th century, um, but I may get in a little into the 21st, uh, but it's enough to look at 20th century examples um, of where um, uh, a contribution in basic science has played a role in transforming society and how. Then I'll ask some uncomfortable questions about current science policy, and I'll try to argue that uh, I'm not disagreeing with it flatly, but I'll try to argue that there's an emphasis which is getting lost and I would like to uh, sort of revive it. Okay, I'll start with uh, this beautiful picture of the main building at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, uh, where actually I'm hoping to go later this year. Uh, its founder, Abraham Flexner, was an industrialist, a businessman, and he, uh, but he was a businessman with a vision and with ideas. And he said this, Throughout the whole history of science, most of the really great discoveries which had ultimately proved to be beneficial to mankind had been made by men and women who were driven not by the desire to be useful, but merely the desire to satisfy their curiosity. So curiosity driven science or otherwise, as we call it otherwise, basic science. Now let's go on and see a few quotes from other sources. Uh, here is a book called uh, Physics in Modern Medicine, and it has an interesting comment. No easy dividing line exists between curiosity-driven research and applied research aimed at a useful biomedical outcome. Now, this should really surprise you because we think that a biomedical outcome such as curing a disease uh, is a kind of applied research which is clearly different from sitting and thinking about, you know, uh, genetics, how, how life uh, originated, how life propagates, how the uh, at the molecular level, how things work. Those are one thing and, you know, curing a disease is another thing. The book is saying there's no useful dividing line between these. Now, uh, following these quotes, uh, let's get a little down to the details and think what social benefit actually means. There are broadly two kinds. One I would call physical well-being, which is medicine, housing, nutrition, security. Okay, that's the well-being of the body, if you like. Without these, you really can't exist. But there's also mental well-being, which is enjoyment, learning, education, socialization, uh, you know. And of course, um, a lot of our lives are spent in the second, uh, you know, focusing on the second aspect uh, of this, uh, of this, uh, of these two. Now, both have been transformed by basic science in unimaginable ways, ways which would have not been recognizable certainly to my grandparents, not even to my parents who were born in the early 20th century. One thing you'll see as I go along is that basic science identifies multiple linkages between different ideas. It doesn't focus on a narrow goal, it focuses on a broader goal, and it is able to change its goals and methods uh, dynamically 
uh, to adapt to its basic purpose, which is to understand nature. And it certainly in history, it has led to game changing applications, life changing applications, many of which we are using every second of our day without thinking about them. And I think on science day, it's a good thing if we all sit for one minute and just think, where are we, you know, where are we using these applications? And how well could we do without them? Answer is not at all. And where did they come from? Why are they there? Why did they come now? Why are things that are happening now? Why are they happening? What is what were the seeds of the events that are changing our lives? So let's look at some events that are changing our lives. Uh, I think this is the first one. Without this, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Um, obviously, um, computers, then mobile phones, uh, telecommunications more generally. Cryptography, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit. It also governs our lives in many ways. Novel materials, extremely important. Okay, uh, the 1950s and 60s were an era when plastics emerged. Of course, that didn't go so well. I mean, in the sense that it also led to a very major problem of pollution. But plastics were an example where, you know, it was a material that just didn't exist earlier and suddenly it took over everything. Today we have actually much better and more customizable materials. GPS positioning is something you can use on a smartphone, uh, but more importantly, it's not just we who use it to find a restaurant to have dinner, but it's used in all kinds of sophisticated applications, uh, including transport, you know, airlines, ships and so on, and uh, just many other things. Now, this is on the left side. These are some advances that, if you like, they are all in the physics domain or physics and engineering domain. On the right side, I've put a bunch of advances which are in the medical domain. Medical imaging, laser surgery, ultrasound, keyhole surgery, Doppler cardiography. I'm not a medical expert, so I pulled out these buzzwords from here and there, radiation therapy, but I also know people who have undergone one or more uh, of these things. Okay, they're increasingly common. They do define our age. Your and well, I don't know about your grandparents, maybe they're still, they're probably still around, but mine, uh, you know, were lived in the early half of the 20th century, and there was no way they had access to any of these kinds of things. Now, for comparison, let's at least recall something, you know, I, I realize I'm sounding like an aged person, but let me recall something from my, some of which was in my younger days, some of which uh, precedes me also. In 1850, if you had a, you know, hole in your skull as this poor person seems to have uh, suffered for whatever reason, there was no way you could get an X-ray scan because it hadn't been discovered. But more recently, in the 1960s, there was no known treatment for Parkinson's disease, which is a progressive and life-threatening illness. In 1965, and this I can tell you because actually my school teacher uh, took a small bunch of us to see uh, TIFR uh, in Bombay, and we actually went into a room which looked exactly like this. So one computer could fill a whole room in 1965, and this entire computer uh, probably has much less computing power than your average iPhone. Long distance phone calling was a huge effort in the 19, up to the 1970s and even 80s. And this is how we used to listen to music until 1982, when uh, compact discs came into existence. So things have changed. Now, who gets the credit for these changes? Well, engineers, businesses, governments, uh, all did their part, played their part, okay? What they did was to take scientific ideas and convert them into applications. In many cases, the ideas were much older, and I'll show you examples, okay? But the process of converting them into applications is not trivial at all, it's not easy. <clears throat> that part we know, we sort of instinctively know that, uh, you know, Nokia company made the first mobile phones or some company made, uh, or Ericsson, and uh, some company made the first, uh, you know, uh, home computer, laptop, and so on and so forth. But without the basic sciences, ideas, uh, and discoveries, and results, and publications uh, that people were able to use, there would have been no applications. You can put any number of engineers, businesses, and governments 
to invent a thing. But if that thing doesn't have a basic science result behind it, they can't invent it. And I'd like to look at four examples first, and then I'll make my comments. Uh, and the examples of basic science I'm choosing are from physics and mathematics. That's because it's my subject. But you can also find similar examples in biology and chemistry and various other things. The four examples I've picked are three from physics and one from maths. The understanding of X-rays, of lasers, of general relativity and of prime numbers. In the case of X-rays, we all know because we've all done it, that it leads to uh, medical imaging as one of its ma major um, applications. Uh, you need some imaging done. You go to a lab which has an X-ray, they turn it on and they get an image of what's inside you. Lasers have had multiple impacts and I, you know, a talk, one can fill an entire talk or five talks on the applications of lasers. I'll just focus a little bit on the medical applications because that's already a huge field by itself. General relativity has played a small but absolutely essential role in the fact that you can use GPS without ending up, let's say, in the wrong restaurant. Hmm? And prime numbers. Uh, are essential, the study of prime numbers is essential for your financial security and banking transactions. And without that, there have been no internet banking today. Okay, so let's proceed and start with X-rays. So here's the person, Wilhelm von Röntgen. He was doing uh, studies on electrical discharge in vacuum tubes in a lab in 1895. Uh, it was partly funded by a university in Germany. And his goal was to investigate the fundamental properties of matter. What happens if you have a vacuum tube? Vacuum tube was useful because, you know, without air inside, uh, you would see phenomena in their, you know, original form without that disturbance. You know, elementary particles can't propagate much in air. They scatter things. They scatter off things. Okay. Atoms, ions, whatever they are, scatter off things. So you take a vacuum tube, you try to hit a plate inside the tube with something and see what comes out. And he accidentally in this process discovered a new kind of radiation which got named as X-rays where X was for the unknown. This you know, I'm sure. Um, the first X-ray photograph ever taken was that of his wife's hand. And uh, of course, this photo includes her wedding ring, which was uh, more opaque to uh, X-rays. And this was the first time living people had seen bones of a living, a person had seen bones of a living person. In this case, uh, his wife uh, was seeing the bones, her own bones. Okay. But until that time, people had only seen bones when, you know, there was a dead body and a skeleton. You could see the bones on a skeleton, but nobody had ever seen it directly on a person who was still living. And so when she saw it, she shouted, I have seen my death. Now, such images in those days required a long exposure. Things have, uh, and things have improved a lot since then. Uh, such images also exposed people to uh, medical risks. That's also improved. Now we understand the risks and we can minimize them. Uh, but there's no underestimating what change this brought uh, to society. And in this case, it actually brought a change within a year. It's a very, very rare example where fundamental science or basic science discovered something and the beneficiaries got that thing in a year. And probably this is why societies in those days were very, very respectful of basic science. They experienced it, uh, what it could do immediately. Now, what was the problem that people were trying to solve socially? It was a problem of gunshot injuries. Many wars were going on in this period, early 20th century. And soldiers were receiving, sadly, there's also a war going on right now, but okay, um, with higher levels of technology. But anyway, in that time, the wars were rather basic. You had to went with a gun and you tried to shoot whoever you could. Now, the point is that bullet, the soldiers would be injured and they would be brought back uh, maybe to a hospital or to a camp or to an army camp. And then there would be a surgeon who would have to figure out, does the soldier actually have a bullet embedded in their body? And if so, how to get it out? Now, getting it out was not so hard. If I know that there's a bullet, I basically give some basic anesthesia, what was there in those days, and dig the bullet out. 
and bandage the wound and hope for the best. The problem was, how do we know where the bullet is? If it's stuck in a, inside your thigh or inside your rib cage or somewhere inside your, uh, somewhere in your shoulder or your arm, how do I find it? Okay, it penetrates, the bullet would have penetrated the skin and flesh and lodged itself inside. Now, I'm, yeah, this is a little painful, just warning, I'll warn you. What uh, engineers and medical researchers were doing was to figure out how to uh, poke, you know, where you have a wound, poke some uh, stick inside. Here are the sticks of that time. Okay and wiggle it around and hope that you can distinguish between a bone, a piece of bone or you know, part of the bone and actu an actual bullet. Bullets are made of metal, so they have a slightly different feel when I rub something on them compared with bone. Now you can imagine this was not at all pleasant for the um, soldier uh, on whom this was being done. But as you see from this page from a medical textbook of that time, the probes were getting better and better. Okay, people were working on more and more complicated probes. There was even one which was connected to a telephone instrument so that you could hear the sound made when that probe is moved around. Okay, and you, that sound would help you to distinguish uh, a, a bullet from bone. No one imagined that without a probe, you could see through the body and find that bullet. It requires imagination. If someone had just said this randomly, they would have been called crazy. But in fact, von Röntgen solved exactly this problem and his fundamental research contributed more than all the efforts to make better probes. Okay, all you would achieve by making better probes is to improve a technique which was unnecessary and unpleasant from the beginning which was the technique of poking into the body a physical object. Instead of that, you actually send through the body some rays and you see what comes out. The body doesn't react in the sense it's not painful um, and you get a, an image of what's inside. Now, I like to show this photo. This is from KEM Hospital in Pune and this is one reason I love Pune where I live. Uh, because they actually regularly garland the photo of this guy. And I think uh, in my mind, this is, you know, gar garland is a sign of respect, especially in our country. And I think a uh, few people, this is in the X-ray department of KEM Hospital. And I think it's a very, very enlightened way uh, to think about uh, the tools that you're using. Okay, let's move on to lasers. Now, lasers were, the invention of lasers is very curious because unlike x-rays, uh, lasers were really an invention, not a discovery. It's something, a tool uh, that you create rather than the discovery of something which actually already exists in nature. Of course, even with x-rays, you can create them and you should if you want to have an x-ray machine. But there are x-rays uh, in the atmosphere and uh, there is a subject called x-ray astronomy after all. Uh, but there's no subject called laser astronomy because nobody outside the earth is shining lasers on us. If you want a laser, you have to make it. First, you have to understand what it is, uh, why it should work, and then you have to make it. This happened in three steps. First, Einstein in 1917, using newly discovered quantum theory, gave an idea that we can actually uh, take a collection of, of, uh, uh, of atoms or molecules and pump them into some excited state uh, and then stimulate them uh, to decay all at the same time to their ground state, emitting a beam of coherent light. That's a laser. Now, it took 41 years. Of course, the World War II came in between, but it took 41 years from that idea uh, to these people, Shaolo and Towns in the US, to publish a theoretical proposal of how you could make something which does this. I, all Einstein said was, in principle, it's doable. These people published a theoretical work, also Basov and Prokhorov in the Soviet Union, published uh, papers uh, showing what you should do to make it. They still didn't make it, by the way. Okay, the first laser was built two years later. Once they published the proposal, how it should be done, at least it became something more viable. And Theodore Maiman in the US published uh, his result 
of actually having built one of these things and seen that it works. A proof of concept. Of course, Mayman's laser was far from the one which you can carry in your pocket and use it to disturb seminars and so on. But uh, it was a proof of concept. So these are the steps. Uh, 41 years at first and then two more years to make it and then another few decades before it went into common usage. Nobody in the 60s saw a laser unless they were allowed into a research lab. But everybody today can go and buy a laser for basically 50 or 100 rupees. Hmm? A laser pointer as it's called. Okay, so let's look at the paper. This is very, very illuminating. This is the abstract of the paper of Shaolo and Towns. You learn a lot from it. First, uh, you learn that I was uh, telling the truth that this was done in 1958. But the second thing you learn is it was done in Bell Telephone Laboratories, Murray Hill, New Jersey. Okay. And uh, that is a private, is, was, and still is. You know, it morphed into various things, AT&T, Lucent, and so on. Uh, but still known as informally as Bell Labs. But Bell Labs had, a, although it was a, a laboratory to do research on telecommunications, it had people of top quality doing research on basic properties of, uh, of light. Okay. And uh, they called it a maser. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, that turned into laser eventually for light because it turned out it could be used for all kinds of light. And um, yeah, uh, this is the abstract. Uh, and I've looked at the paper and I'll make some comment about that in a minute. But first, let's look at the next paper, which came from Mayman in 1960. Now here, this is not the abstract. This is the full paper. That's it. That's it. There's nothing more. Okay. This is the paper um, of Mayman uh, showing that, and as you see in the first line, he says, Shaolo and Towns have proposed a technique for generation uh, of very monochromatic radiation, etc., using an alkali vapor, blah, blah. Then he says, uh, in this laboratory, an optical pumping technique has been successfully applied, etc. Okay, and that's it. Now, two, one point you'll notice, both in this entire paper and in the previous paper, if you read it, there's no mention of any purpose or application. Okay, this paper simply did not discuss any possible application of the technique, let alone applications relevant to society. It's not that the authors didn't think of it, but they were focused on something else. They were focused on understanding nature from a basic point of view, in this case, light, light and atoms. Now, one more point I'd like to make is that uh, Professor Mayman was actually he wasn't also he wasn't really a professor he was employed at hughes research laboratories a division of hughes aircraft company in california now you've heard of howard hughes uh, he had a kind of legendary life a very strange person all that there are movies about him but the point is uh, that this is not a university and it's not even a company that makes telephones it's a company that at that time made aeroplanes and what was an aeroplane company doing funding a guy to make a stimulated optical radiation? It's, it's not known, at least to me, whether they asked the people they funded to look for social applications but or practical applications. But it's clear from the papers that there's no mention of it. And it means that private industry was busy funding uh, research, which they themselves could not see any useful outcome to them. This is a hallmark of the middle of the 20th century, uh, which I think forever will be seen as a particularly enlightened time once the World War, World War II ended, uh, where at least scientifically people were very enlightened about how they want to think about the future. In fact, the United States rose to be the leading world power in the 20th century, largely because of joint government and private sponsorship of basic science. The example of lasers seems to suggest that it was private sponsorship, but I don't know whether they had government grants to do their research. And certainly the top universities of that time, Berkeley and so on, uh, produced a lot of important basic research, which also contributed and with government funding. Now, see where lasers have reached today. Actually, we won't see that. 
I'm going to just show you what they've done in medicine. It's just a very short summary of laser applications only in medicine. And what you see in the first three columns is basically the type of laser and the range of wavelengths involved, you know, ultra ultraviolet, infrared and something and visible light and so on. But if you see on the right hand side from LASIK, which everybody knows now, it's eye surgery to general surgery of, uh, you know, tattoo removal, glaucoma, uh, various, of course, eye surgery is uh, throughout one of the more important things, but skin resurfacing uh, and hair removal, skin resurfacing can be very important for people who have had some skin disease or some burn, uh, general surgery. It's just amazing. Okay. And all this came from essentially uh, two or three groups thinking about how to uh, stimulate coherent radiation. Okay. So that's my comments about laser. Are there any questions or comments? You know, I have this sort of dream that one day I'm giving a talk and suddenly in the middle of the talk, the internet disappears. And I keep giving the talk because nobody can tell me that they're not hearing me. Nobody will phone me. Nobody can reach me. I'm unreachable. And I keep giving the talk. So just to convince me that I'm not dreaming, would somebody please uh, show that they're there? Anyone? Hello. Yes. Can you hear? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you can't see the audience, but they're all yeah. there. But also, I, I don't mind not seeing the audience, but I would wish they had a question or comment or something. Is there a question from the audience right now? So, Neil, I think you can continue. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to general relativity, which was proposed by Albert Einstein in 19... 15, as we know, it describes the law of gravitation in a radically new mathematical formulation as the curvature of space time. Now, it's a very difficult and esoteric subject. And let me say that 99% of physicists, professional physicists don't understand it, let alone the general public, or you can communicate lots of vague words and all that, but it's very difficult to get a deep understanding. Hmm? Okay, now, Einstein did this why to understand gravity, uh, to understand nature, to understand space and time itself. Okay. And for a long time, including right till the end of the 20th century, it was thought of as merely a very sophisticated theoretical science with a few tests, astronomical tests. But slowly, it has grown to take over uh, a larger part of astronomy. One reason is, of course, the fact that general relativity predicts gravitational waves and they have now been observed and they are now observed they now become their observation is becoming a major part of astronomy the second fact is that black holes are the most common object in the universe and this is again uh, something with general relativity first predicted and it's still the only theory that can really explain them but in fact gr is needed for the global positioning system to work correctly GPS. And uh, what it does is that this theory gives very, very small corrections to the naive formula you would get if you used Newtonian gravity, which has been around for many centuries. And if you use Newtonian gravity and try to calculate the uh, time uh, for signals to reach a satellite and come back, and this is basically it's some kind of triangulation which enables us using satellites to figure out where we are. If we use Newtonian physics, uh, then over many days, errors would build up and we would end up uh, as much as 10 or 11 kilometers away from our destination, which as you can well imagine, would not would make GPS quite useless. Okay, The idea of knowing where you are to within 10 kilometers is not at all the kind of accuracy that GPS needs. Okay, uh, prime numbers, the fourth and last example. So, you know, pure mathematicians working in number theory have been studying prime numbers for centuries. Uh, the person who really made a very major contribution was Leonhard Euler, uh, a Swiss mathematician whose face is very rightly 
shown on the Swiss bank note of that time. I don't know if this is still the current uh, 10 franc note, but uh, he's certainly a very celebrated figure in Switzerland and in Europe and in the world for what he did. Now, in his time, obviously, there were no websites, no credit cards and no internet banking. And if they did, if they had been there, he probably wouldn't have cared about them because he, like many mathematicians, was focused on a totally different world than the world of everyday experience. But today, public key encryption, which is a very uh, important algorithm uh, based on the properties of prime numbers, their factorization, the typical size of prime numbers and so on. Uh, this is a, is a technology which keeps your online secret safe. It's the way that you can enter your password on a bank website and the bank, even without knowing your password, so nobody sitting in the bank is watching this thing come and say, aha, this is so and so, this is his password, let me write it down and then uh, if the bank fires me one day, I'll steal that person's money from their account. Doesn't work like that. The reason is that you can log in, you can enter a password and the person at the other end doesn't know your password, but they know it's your password without knowing your password. This uses public key encryption and the factorization of prime numbers, something you should read about. Um, and um, yeah, uh, without that, no internet banking uh, and, you know, internet banking used to be a thing only where people, you know, send money across borders and all that, uh, you know, in foreign remittance and all that. But now it's nothing like that. Now you need it for your Paytm or PhonePay or uh, Bheem UPI, everything to work. Everything uses internet banking. Okay, and there are many more examples, which I can't, couldn't talk about here just because of lack of time. Microwave understanding of these leads to led to mobile phone technology. It also, of course, led to microwave ovens, uh, something called the radon transform led to magnetic resonance imaging. So radon transform is also a mathemat partly a mathematical technique, but then, of course, many important properties of magnetism in quantum physics are used. And when you combine those with this transform thing, you get MRI, which can scan the insides or you know, your insides much better than X-rays and give you 3D images. Radioactivity led to techniques like gamma knife. Gamma knife is actually something which behaves like a knife, so it can cut tissue like cancerous tissue, but it isn't made of steel, it's made of gamma rays. Raman spectroscopy has led to medical treatments. There are just so many, it never ends. The understanding of evolution and genetics has led to treatment for diabetes, a very uh, important and grave disease. Uh, particle accelerators led to the development of the World Wide Web and the HTTP protocol. So the internet actually was started basically by the US military and it was a technique to route signals in multiple channels uh, to a common destination where the destination computer would reassemble them and it didn't matter if one or two of the channels got cut off for any reason. Okay, that's the internet. But the World Wide Web is the idea that using the internet, we don't just send information actively like emails uh, or files, but we store information in one place 24 hours a day so that another person, whenever they want, can access it. Okay, so that's the web page or the URL. That's why I said HTTP. So the World Wide Web is not the same as internet. It's a development over the internet. But the beauty of it uh, is that now you can say, I'm going to go to this web page. Okay, like this morning, I went to the web page of IIT Hyderabad for, because I have some curiosity about institutes where I'm going to give a talk. So, you know, going to a web page is kind of strange expression and it wouldn't have existed except for the work done at CERN in 1990, where they needed that kind of thing for their data on particle acceleration, which was going on and still is going on in CERN. So these are all interesting and I would urge everyone to look them up. Now, today research planning has become more short term, goal directed and narrowly defined. This is also not surprising. I'm not saying it's wrong. The world has failed to conquer poverty and to provide a decent life for all. And there's a lot of pressure now that this must change. So this is fine. But it is thought that the correct change is to support primarily or only application-oriented research 
and here is where the thinking can uh, lose perspective okay and let me show you first of all let's see some newspaper articles so many uh, over the years first one in 2013 then 2018 then 2019 again i'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on application oriented research but i think uh, all of us know that in the last few years it appears that this is the only kind of research that a responsible socially conscious person would want to do hmm. the person who wants to tinker in their lab understanding the laws of nature or do calculations or develop quantum field theory or string theory is seen as a person who is selfishly isolating from the needs of society well that's the prevailing view, but I think it should be questioned and it can be, and it has been. And here is somebody who questioned it. Steven Weinberg, legendary physicist and Nobel laureate who passed away last year. He said, if J.J. Thompson in 1897 had been directed to work on practical problems, he would have developed a better steam boiler. Okay. What J.J. Thompson did, however, was to discover the electron. And you can judge for yourself whether it was the discovery of a better steam boiler or the discovery of an electron which really propelled the changes in the following century okay and again there is an issue here it's not that everybody could possibly have discovered the electron a few people had the talent necessary the skill the laboratory the motivation to do it the problem which i like to highlight and especially on science day is that one should be careful about directing people like this because the ones who direct them probably know much less about what those people are going to find. Uh, even the people, J.J. Thompson himself probably didn't know what he was going to find, but the methods he used, the, the techniques he used and the curiosity he showed led to this dramatic result. So it's something for us to think about. So now I'll, I'll wrap up in the next uh, five or 10 minutes. What were the seeds of progress in the last 150 years up to now, late 19th century up to now, we're already through one fifth of the 21st century. So the theory of evolution was very important and genetics, which came sort of along with it, because after all theory of evolution has to do with how genes are passed on, but genetics has to do with what genes really are, what they do. But from that extreme end of biology, you think, yeah, of course, that will biology always affects, you know, how we deal with human problems. But number theory, the theory of just abstract numbers, how such a cold, un, unhuman, unsocial activity. Well, just think it was one of the major seeds of progress. Advanced geometry has been another. Quantum theory has, of course, I mean, quantum theory, you can never stop talking about. Nuclear physics, which is an outgrowth of quantum theory at a very small scale, nuclear, atomic, uh, nuclear, I mean, atomic and then nuclear and then particle physics. Special and general relativity, I gave you one example of that. Okay. Now, it's very interesting if you ask, and I asked myself this question while making this talk, who paid for all this work? Hmm? Who really did? Well, it's not so clear. I mean, some cases were really bizarre. One example uh, has to do with this piece of crockery. This beautiful cup is called a Wedgwood. This, this is called Wedgwood crockery. And Wedgwood uh, is a type of very sophisticated crockery that was made and sold to households, you know, very rich households uh, in England um, some, you know, a long time back. And it so happened that uh, Darwin's uh, father married the daughter of a Wedgwood, of, uh, of Mr. Wedgwood, so the Wedgwood family, okay? So Darwin's grandfather was friends with Mr. Wedgwood and Mr. Wedgwood's daughter married Darwin's father, this Charles Darwin, of course, on the right. And this marriage led to the possibility, led to the family, Darwin family becoming very rich because of this crockery business. And it was Darwin's father who was induced to fund his own research uh, into nature, which led to his theory of evolution. So very, very odd. And it's, you know, it's a strange model. It's family money. Let's just call it that. On the other hand, Einstein did his great work in his spare time, essentially not funded, 
while employed in a patent office. So if the patent office was basically paying for him to do their work, he could have as well been working in a bank. Uh, it just kept his body and soul together while he thought about his uh, uh, ideas on relativity. That's very rare and exceptional, probably not a very good model for how things should be done. But most research was supported by public universities and some of it also by industry. Okay, so that's how it worked. Now, public funds are much harder to get for curiosity driven research today than at any time in the past. And industries, especially in India, show very little interest in seeding possible breakthroughs unless they can see what is in it for them. That's quite a sad situation because India is at the economic stage, well, not exactly, but is at a kind of stage that, you know, America was at the time post-war when they had to build a new society where there would be no poverty and where the nation would as a whole become wealthy. India keeps, we keep talking about that now, but when Bell Telephones and uh, Hughes Aircraft Corporation were hosting labs which could do these, carry out these breakthroughs, uh, there's essentially no industry that I know of in India hosting any lab which will bring about basic science breakthroughs. At least I don't know of any. Public funds are there, uh, but they are now today uh, quite positive about mega projects like gravitational waves or particle accelerators. But, and I, I like those kind of, that kind of physics, that's the kind of physics I understand best actually. But there's something called blue sky tabletop research, the kind where you tinker in a lab and you find new basic science results. Uh, the kind of work that gave us X-rays and lasers. And it's not so easy. Uh, in fact, it's really hard to get funding for those kinds of research now. That's just a fact. Now, uh, I would also like to point out here that there's, it's, not, it's not just governments uh, who are unable to think about it and industries. It's a broader, there's a broader aspect which I call an intellectual crisis. And I'll quote something from a nice book that I saw recently, uh, which basically says that our way of thinking as a society has lost this kind of energy to think about discovering the properties of nature. And well, it, the book has warnings for the future. The key point is, that we today are using the basic science of the last century, in fact, of the early last century, of one century ago, 100 years ago, that we are using. Okay, so 100 years, scientists of 100 years ago gave some seeds of progress. We are eating the fruit growing from those seeds. Question is, what seeds are we planting ourselves? What are the possible seeds of tomorrow's progress? Well, one can only guess. There are some obvious ones you can guess. For example, room temperature superconductivity or topological phases. These can give us um, new ability to manipulate uh, materials to a point where we may be able to get very, very low cost energy uh, for transportation and so on. We may also uh, you know, be able to manipulate switches and materials, uh, you know, things which work digitally, which do various kinds of, of jobs. Um, there's atomic and molecular physics, the study of quantum entanglement, the study of ultra cold atoms, which allow to manipulate matter uh, in the most fine detail possible to make things like Bose-Einstein condensate. There's quantum information and quantum gravity, which are interestingly very interrelated. Okay. And of course, the first has something to do with quantum computing, which is important. The second has something to do with black holes, which are also important. Somehow there's a linkage in these subjects that nobody fully understands. There's elementary particle physics. Nobody has ever figured out what use neutrinos can be, but you know, or the Higgs particle or whether they are super particles, but these could be seeds of some interesting progress in the future. And finally, there's astrophysics which gives us dark matter, dark energy, gravitational waves. And these all are right now very, very basic science ideas, but we don't know what they could lead to. So these are some of the C possible seeds. 
Now, people keep talking of futuristic medical techniques. Some are becoming reality. You know, every year you go to a hospital, you'll find the hospital has different stuff going on. And some year they'll say, oh, no, now we don't do things that way. Now we do things this way. That's because a new technique has emerged. And I'll just make a, I'll give you a list of buzzwords. I'm not an expert on these. But for example, active capsule endoscopy, for example, or, you know, self-propelled propelled endoscopes have to do with inserting something into the body that's actually an autonomous probe which can do what you tell it. It can swim around, it can go somewhere, it can look at something, it can fix something. It's like, like having a little, uh, you know, electrician and mechanical engineer inside the body at a very microscopic scale, which can do things that you tell it. Okay, telemedicine, very obvious, uh, the idea that you control some arm of some uh, device and carry out a surgery, but you're living at one end of the planet and the device is at another end and you're controlling it through computers. In fact, many surgeries are robotic even in the same place, like you might be in the same hospital, but you don't do the surgery by your hand, you uh, move some switches or some mouse or something and your uh, and your robotic arm does the surgery. So if it can be done in the same room by you, then you can as well be somewhere else. And I, I mentioned room temperature, superconductivity, but the really striking applications may not be any of these. Hmm? It would be very narrow minded to think that we can tell what the applications will be. It's the people who are doing the basic science who will stumble on something and they'll come about by accident when the right discovery is made and the right application is found. So the need is not only for basic science to be funded, but also to be supported by the intellectual climate of the times. Okay, it should not happen that a person who is stumbling around trying to find something is being bombarded on Twitter by saying, oh, you're wasting money and you shouldn't be doing this and you should be working on sanitation or something like that. So here's the book I mentioned, Scientific Freedom. Uh, and here are some quotes from the book. And it's basically what I've been saying. I was very actually thrilled to find a book which basically says something I've been saying for many years in my talks, that modern life is enriched by new technologies, but most of this bounty comes from scientific discoveries made decades ago, a source that seems to have dried up in recent years. And therefore, our intellectual account is becoming overdrawn at a time when the demands on it are actually increasing. And this should look familiar. There's no shortage of initiatives aiming to deal with problems like global warming, population growth and terrorism. Okay, but one vital factor is overlooked. If current policies had applied at the beginning of the 20th century, the world today would be a much harsher place. We wouldn't have the technologies that we are using on global warming, population growth and terrorism. So the consequences of today's policies are approaching this category that the operation was a success, but the patient died. And it will affect the very foundations of our civilization. It's a very, very grim prediction. And I think it needs to be taken seriously. So I'll end with a quote from someone I know well, David Gross, Nobel laureate, who visited India in 2016 to speak at the Science Congress. And he uh, is a keen observer of societies and was you know reading the newspapers and talking to us about what was going on in the country and he made this comment new inventions technologies products that can compete on the world stage are in the end based on new discoveries new understanding of the workings of nature what we call basic science the same thing exactly that flexner said which i quoted right in the beginning so my suggestion is that you replace the slogan make in india with the slogan, discover, invent, and make in India. And I cannot tell you whether this was suggestion was taken seriously by the folks up there, but it's a suggestion which I think everyone, which I think all academics, which all IITs uh, and ICERs and our entire system uh, should take very seriously. So on that note, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunil, for that uh, eye-opening and riveting talk. Uh, it's a very sobering thought indeed, and people should, I hope, have taken attention of this. So are there any questions from the audience?
Yes, go ahead. This is my question. One second, I will reach, reach out to you with the mic. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay, uh, so actually, I have two questions. So, the first one was that how do you think that such a change in mindset came? That in the last century, everyone was, uh, at least in the funding attitude, they were funding even those projects which had no application versus now where they, you need to show the applications. So, maybe uh, how do you think that such kind of a change came? And then, yeah. regarding the second question, actually, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I missed. Uh, so, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, actually, uh, this, I have been having this debate with my friend too. That he was suggesting that Elon Musk should not be focusing on Mars and terraforming, and he should rather spend the effort, uh, you know, bringing the change here on Earth because uh, going to Mars and I mean, such kind of project is not feasible. And I was on the other side, so but he's not very from a science background. So what do you think that arguments I could give to him uh, to show no, this could be the benefit or that? Yeah. The, the, there's a very simple answer and it's the same answer to both of your questions. There's a distinction between short term and long term. Okay. So if society in early 20th century had declared that the only important thing to work on is the immediate short term interest of humanity, it would have not encouraged J.J. Thompson or von Röntgen or Heisenberg, Schrödinger, Dirac, Einstein, anybody else, because nobody could see anything useful could come out of that for human beings. Okay. Now, most people think short term. Actually, most people don't even think short term enough to make plan for next week. Okay. It's a fact about human beings. We are short term. And let me say, the less informed we are, the less we think, the less we read, the more short term we become. Now, of course, you could say short term is great. You know, I mean, I'm 65 years old. I might have a few years to live. Why don't I go out and party till I drop? You know, that's a short term goal, which uh, sounds very nice, actually. You know, go travel. Let me not exaggerate about partying, but go travel, see the world, do things, enjoy life. I don't have to work after I retire. I have pension. Why would I do anything at all? Okay. There's an answer to this question. And the answer is that in some way, though I'm not a religious person and I'm not, you know, I don't know what is there in the afterlife, but I would like that after I'm gone from this earth, something which I did will leave behind a contribution which will help someone in some way. I don't know what way, but I would like that to happen. Okay. Now, if we, and I'm not stopping anybody else from working on healthcare, from working on basic sanitation, from working on how affordable housing, I'm not stopping anyone. I'm not even taking away their money. Okay, you can take away all the money of uh, basic science research in India and build a few more hospitals. But in the scheme of things, it's not going to be a very dramatic fractional change. Okay, and you could take away also all the money from lots of other things, which I won't name in this talk, which would also help you to build more hospitals. Okay, human beings do a lot of things which don't help us in any way. Human beings spend money on buying more electronic, more and more electronic goods, creating more and more garbage, so many things. But when it comes to basic science, it's a small part of our activity, which is dedicated to the long term future of humanity. The long term future of humanity might involve going away from this planet in order to survive. It's not, uh, it's not unthinkable. Many people have written about it. Okay. The long term humanity, uh, future of humanity might involve making links with alien civilizations which might actually exist. Okay. I mean, who knows that they don't? Everybody is like, yeah, you know, we only care about uh, 100 square feet of uh, plot outside my, my shop and uh, what happens on the street, in the town, in the country, in the state, in the country is no business of mine. Fine. Be short term. Be. Uh, very local in your outlook, but that's not what we human beings are capable of. We are capable of something better. And I emphasize that 
it has already paid off. Look at the rich countries of the world, the one the developed countries and the ones that are developing fast, they have invested in basic science. The US did it, Europe did it, uh, Soviet Union, then Soviet Union did it, although with certain flaws, but they did it. And uh, even China has been doing it. Mm. China has uh, China has path breaking results in neutrino physics at their Diabe reactor uh, in the time that India is still talking about building the India based neutrino observatory, which has basically been squashed by lack of common sense of purpose. It's just not happening. And everybody has gone ahead with neutrino physics and we are stuck. Okay. I can tell you that, you know, the, the idea that you don't do this and therefore the money will go to that or the brain power of the person will go to that. It's not true. For example, you, I see some of you students sitting there. Supposing you want to do basic science and somebody forces you not to do basic science. And you say, okay, I'm going to join a company which will pay me to develop computer games. Can somebody stop you doing stop you doing that? No, that's a viable career. You'll make a lot of money and, uh, and you'll be using your brains because computer games do require smart people to design them. Okay, and what has society gained? Tell me after that. Did you actually solve the local by going and becoming a computer gamer or a bank teller? Did you actually solve any uh, problems of any village or of people, people's access to water or something? I mean, you can work on those things too, but the people who want to do basic science must be not just allowed, but encouraged to work on basic science. I hope this answer a bit rambling, but I hope it addressed both your questions. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks again for the answer. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. So, sir, thank you for the wonderful talk. I have a small question. Uh, you mentioned about multiple linkages between different ideas as a point in one of your slides. Uh, it is true that uh, different fields, uh, uh, like say somebody working in basic sciences and somebody who's working in uh, biological streams or technological streams, uh, they would only be able to assess the requirements. Like, the only way uh, basic science can evolve into applications is that if there is a communication link between those two. Like if somebody recognizes that some basic science, the applications can be used some other. Uh, Very true. Purpose. I agree. So now uh, my question is: uh, in coming to primary institutions and colleges uh, around the world, or in our there is very little, if not completely, uh, zero uh, communication between departments. Let's say uh, different departments working on different things. Uh, we don't know about those on like, other departments. Or so, how do we address those challenges? So, like you said, uh, at the topmost, people will take away the money if you don't spend it for some good thing. But if departments come together, share ideas, uh, communicate with each other, then you will have much more uh, opportunity to uh, you know, fight back. Absolutely. And uh... Communication is a topic on which I could give another talk uh, of course I'm not a good uh, I'm not an expert on sociology or psychology but let me say that uh, one of the biggest hindrances of Indian academia is the lack of communication and uh, I one reason I see is that we are all very insecure Indian academia is kind of defined by insecure people and we are very scared that something somebody tells us is going to challenge the way we think about our field or it's going to turn or it's going to lower our state social standing or uh, it's going to contradict what we are telling our students. So Indian academia is very closed to the idea of communication and it's a tragedy. Actually, if you know American and European and also Japanese, probably also Russian academia, they have a very um, sociable culture where people drink tea together, people have lunch together, people meet informally for a chat in a room and the room is very lively. I've been in those rooms every time I go abroad, the room is lively. And if it's a colloquium and you go for it and the colloqu it's a chemistry colloquium, you're a physicist, you go for it. You may have some idea and you may not want to mention it in the colloquium, but you may mention it in the tea break afterwards or before. To somebody who is in chemistry that will fertilize an idea and that idea may go forward and become something path breaking 
can't happen in India. We don't even, you know, I mean, it's sad. In, in my institute, I serve Pune. We used to have lunch together till two years ago, then pandemic came. But even that lunch had reached a stage where, you know, five, seven, eight people would go for lunch. We have 120 faculty. Nobody takes the view that, well, we'll go for lunch so that we can talk science to people from outside our discipline. Nobody does that. I don't know how to change it, but uh, at this age, I've become very cynical about the attitude, the open-mindedness of Indian academia. It's not open-minded at all. Let's put it in one line. Thank you, sir. Thanks for coming once again for the very nice uh, eye-opening translation. We have one more question. Uh, hi, Professor Moody. Uh, I have a question um, uh, regarding the fund transition in the basic science you talked about. So, uh, my question is, can media, particularly the social media, play any role in uh, solving this issue of fund transition in the basic science? Of course, social media plays or can play a role, definitely, uh, but it plays the opposite role right now. Because social media, which I, I follow social media, I have a Twitter account, I don't do much on it at present, but it, it basically, social media seems to work towards short-term interest and building barriers, though I know there are a lot of people who try to build also communication through social media, and I like that. Uh, I wish I had the time to do that. Uh, people do, I see people in chemistry or physics or math putting out a question on social media, uh, uh, you know, that they're facing in their work and ask random people for suggestions. Problem, problem with social media, and I may sound a bit elitist here, but, you know, if you ask random people for suggestions on anything, you get random suggestions, including from people who don't have any idea what they're talking about or even what you asked. Okay. So there is actually a meaning of an institute, like you are in one institute, at least you meet people from that institute. And if that culture grows, then some outcome can be there uh, within that institute, that institute will do well. And you, there is a, there should be a certain level of trust. You can say, well, this is my colleague from IIT Department of Chemistry. I should be able to trust her or trust him to at least have a basic knowledge of the subject they are talking about and something can grow. Social media is very dispersed, you know, it's very, very, very dispersed. And it has created, I mean, it has given a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have a voice. I like that part. It has given a voice to quite poor people because earlier the poor had no access to post any opinion anywhere, right? You had to write a, to post an opinion, you have to know the editor of a newspaper or write a letter in fancy English. Now you can post your opinion. So that's the good side. The bad side is that it's too dilute and it too many people who are not serious get engaged on a particular problem. I mean, let's be serious. When we talk about any issue affecting the country, it would nice to be it would be nice if we could be serious. So 99% of social media is unserious on the subject. Its only goal is to knock down somebody or other or demonize somebody or other or propagate somebody or other or get somebody elected or get somebody have a glorious image glorify yourself that those are not serious goals they don't help human they don't help humanity in any way so i'm a bit pessimistic at least at present what social media would do okay with that uh, we uh, are <laughs> we, uh, 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 thanks to me again for very uh, thank you eye-opening uh, talk and reminding us of our, uh, in our role, at least as far as the student level is concerned. I hope everybody in the audience will light up uh, uh, on Twitter feed today. Okay, thank you very much everyone once again. Thank you, thank you and bye everyone. Uh, no questions. Uh, let's now move on to the next section. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Mayud Bahari to chair this session. 
Dr. Mayur is a faculty member at the Department of Physics at IIT Hyderabad and has been working in the area of black hole astrophysics, UV, optical, and X ray microscopy and relativistic simulation. I request Mayur sir to kindly take over. Thank you. Uh, can you connect to Professor Oja? Yeah, Professor Oja is here. Hi, hello. Hi. Can, you, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear. Can you hear me? Yes, yes can hear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Professor Devendra Oja from TIFR Mumbai. And uh, Professor Oja received his PhD degree from Strasbourg University, France in 1994 in the field of astronomy and astrophysics. After that, he joined TIFR Mumbai in 1997. And then before joining, he had two postdoctoral positions, one at IIPA Pune, and then one at IAP Paris, France. He is currently the chairperson of TIFR Balloon Facility. Uh, and today you are going to listen about more from about this balloon facility, which is just 82 kilometers from here. Uh, and there are interesting research work also going on with the balloons. So Professor Oja will be talking about such uh, facilities and in more detail. And he was also the chairperson of Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at TIFR from 2013 to 2019. He is also the first dean of finance since October 2019. Uh, coming to his research areas, uh, he is working on optical and infrared astronomies in the field and mostly encompasses the interstellar mediums and star forming regions. But he is not only doing the scientific research, he's also involved in design, development, and operation of astronomical instruments, particularly infrared instruments. And this also includes the operation of 100 centimeter TFR balloon borne far infrared telescope. Yes, it's the infrared far infrared telescope, but it's on balloon. And then development of instruments for small satellite missions of ISRO for carrying out infrared spectroscopy imaging surveys, and also uh, the development of near infrared spectrometer and imaging cameras for ground based Indian telescopes. He is also a fellow of Indian Academy of Science and National Academy of Science in India, and he published more than 160 research papers and articles. So without any further ado, I am uh, inviting Professor Oja to deliver his talk and lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mayuk. So I will just share my slides. Yes. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, yes, Professor. Yeah, yeah I'm just, uh, just, I'm moving my slide. It's moving. Uh, yes, we can see. Yeah, it's moving, right. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks Mayuk again. Uh, so uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, possibilities of space science exploration for particularly in the area of uh, uh, astronomy, atmospheric sciences, but there are many other applications where now space science has become very important. And one of the important tool now has become very popular is using balloons. Uh, for such kind of uh, exploration. So this talk is basically mixed for the uh, students who are working on research problem as well as engineering student, particularly who are developing a technologies for aerospace sciences and so on. So, so basic idea of this talk is to give uh, possibilities for students to explore uh, space using different technologies. And one of the tool is of course balloon. So I will explain why balloons are so important. So the outline of my talk is basically, I will give you the overview of scientific ballooning in India. So this talk is also basically uh, concentrated on the self-reliant of India, basically a lot of technology which are not known uh, to students. And one of these technology which was developed almost like more than 50 years ago, uh, actually was used for cosmic ray detection and X-ray observations. So I will uh, tell about that overview. 
and then I will explain uh, this facility, which is, as Mayuk said, is just 80 kilometers from IIT Hyderabad. And then why we use scientific ballooning, uh, this is very important because any exper space experiment cannot be done only with rockets. First, you have to prove this in a uh, low altitude atmosphere using balloons. And this is one of the technology which is very useful. And I will give you some example where this technology is going in future. And if time permits, I will show you a video clips or movies of some of the launches. Uh, of course, that will depend on uh, how my talk goes. Okay, so the historic background of balloon is uh, quite uh, old history, almost two centuries ago, when this evolution of balloon designs were explored. And uh, it was actually some, uh, uh, these balloons were developed somewhere in France, almost 230 years ago by two brothers called Montgolfier brothers, who basically experimented balloons that time for scientific explorations like cosmic detection and so on. And, uh, and the one of the major discovery happened with balloons was in 1912, when Victor has discovered cosmic rays. And uh, as you know, subsequently in 1936, he received the Nobel Prize of that discovery. And this experiment was done in balloons. And then later on, uh, uh, these experiments were going to much higher altitude, like stato stratospheric uh, altitudes in the Earth atmosphere, where scientists were using rubber balloons basically to reaching higher altitude like 20 kilometer which is called stratospheres and finally the modern day natural say balloons were discovered in 1950 by german scientists called Wingen, and after that uh, this became very popular experiment for explore space explorations and uh, in india the stereo ballooning was started in late 1940s by dr homi j bhava who was the founding director of tifr and that time bhava and his team were doing a, a study of secondary cosmic rays by sending the rubber balloons from different parts of india up to the altitude of 25 kilometer and uh, these balloons were used to detect the cosmic rays and that is the time when this ballooning activity was started in india and then it was realized around 1970s that uh, this experiment is going to be a most important exp experiment for space acceleration. And uh, after cosmic rays, people thought about that we should do the uh, observation in X-rays. However, doing experiment in uh, cosmic rays and X-rays, one of the major problem is the high charge background when you go above the atmosphere. And then it was realized that uh, uh, we should set up these facilities close to Hyderabad, which is just just uh, close to the geomagnetic equator. So basically, Hyderabad is just 90 degree above the geomagnetic equator. So if you are at the equator, then actually you have a reduced charge particles and then you can do better experiment in cosmic rays and X-rays. And considering this in mind, in 1969, this facility was developed. And now this facility is, there are many aspects are under one roof. For example, we do the balloon productions we do the, we carry out the launches, data collection, and recovery of payloads. So everything is under one roof. And generally, the we fly our large volume zero pressure balloons. I will come to later what are the zero pressure balloons in two seasons. So these are, of course, nowadays these balloon experiments are done throughout the year. But the major experiments which are done by large volume zero pressure balloons are done in summer and winter season, uh, which is start from February to April and October to December. And these experiments experiments are done in the areas of astronomy, astrobiology, atmospheric sciences, and now there are a lot of commercial activities are also uh, carried out uh, using balloons. And apart from these uh, scientific experiments, we also do a lot of research and developments in balloon engineering to uh, keep in mind our future developments, uh, particularly the technologies and so on. So a lot of R&D activities also done in this place. And this is just the glimpses of the, these facilities, which is uh, located in the area of 60 acres, where we have a very large balloon fabrication facilities. We have a balloon launch ground, uh, which is used uh, from where we fly the large balloons. Then we have a, um, a communication devices like S-band antenna, which with, uh, using which we can control the balloons and payload and so on. Okay, so now these facilities, uh, is used by national and international scientists from almost like since 50 years 
since 50 years. Particularly, this facility provides opportunities for research, development, test, and evolution of science payload using high latitude stratospheric balloons. And these balloons are generally uh, flown up to the height of 40 or uh, 42 kilometers uh, uh, in the area of stratospheres. And also, these are used by user scientists from national laboratories, University of India, as well as from uh, abroad. So many countries have used these facilities. And apart from that, I also already mentioned that uh, we do necessary research and development to meet the future requirement of scientific ballooning. And the question is that why we use scientific balloons? Uh, so one of the reason is, of course, balloon offers a low cost, quick response method for doing scientific investigations as compared to rocket launch on satellite experiment. And another thing is that balloons are mobile, so they can be launched as places where experiment needs to be conducted. And other the advantage of balloon is that they can be ready for flight in a shorter period and the flight cycle time is very short. So once your experiment is done, you can repeat that same experiment. And the most important aspect of balloon experiment is that you can do the in situ measurements at different latitudes. So you can carry out these experiments from different places and particularly this is important for the atmospheric science experiments. And the last one is, of course, balloon payload instrument can be readily upgraded to keep the developments in detector technology. So a lot of detector technology uh, experiments can be done in balloons and later on these te technology can be tried in the rockets and so on. So what are these balloons? Uh, so I will just explain some of the major con constituents of these balloons. So these are generally called zero pressure balloons. Uh, zero pressure in the sense that once you fly the balloon when it reaches at the ceiling altitude where then it just floats depending on the upper wind the differential pressure inside the balloon and the outside atmosphere is zero and that's why it is called zero pressures so basically once a balloon goes up the air cools and pressure decreases so balloon expands it so the total pressure inside and outside is if you take a differential pressure is zero and that's why the name zero pressure comes and uh, these balloons are basically made of the uh, special polythene films, we generally call plastic films. Uh, th these are the different sections of the plastic films. And these like plastic uh, sections are basically uh, uh, glued by the load tapes, which are uh, very, um, has a large strength to carry the heavy payload. And generally these load tapes are used to glue these sections of the plastics and uh, these are the mostly uh, load tapes are uh, the most important aspect of the balloon to carry any heavy payloads and then there are many other like there are top end fittings and bottom end fittings bottom end fittings is basically used to carry the payload scientific payload which you want to fly and top end fitting are generally used uh, to escape the gas in in case your balloon you want to fly at a higher altitude or generally what happens these balloons are flown during day and night time so because of the temperature change renewable temperature change in the day and night balloon can go up and down so you can use this top and fittings or inflation tube to escape the gas to keep the balloon at the same altitude so that your scientific ex experiments are done um, uh, carefully. Uh, so these are the main cons constituents of the balloons. And generally, these balloons are flown at the height of stratospheres. So generally, the commercial aircrafts are flown at the height of 10 to 12 kilometers. And, uh, and these balloon experiments are generally done in stratosphere, which is 20 kilometer to 50 kilometers. And then mesospheres are also one area where now a lot of competition is going on, where uh, scientists wants to fly the balloons. And I will show you one example where balloon facility Hyderabad has a made a world record to reaching mesosphere. So in balloon experiment, one of the competition is that always you want to go higher and higher altitude so that you can explore the new area in the atmosphere. So generally tropospheres are well explored now with balloons. Stratosphere are the very important areas because one, if you see this diagram here in the left, so when, when you fly a balloon, when you go above the altitude, you see clearly that uh, temperature suddenly decreases and then there is a temperature inversion. So this is a very 
difficult area to fly balloons, particularly when temperature is minus 80 degree uh, centigrade surrounding temperature. And when you are flying this balloon, which are made of plastic, they can be, become brittle and balloon can burst. So, so one, one has to develop really a technology to fly this balloon, which are passing through trop tropospheres and then when they reach to the stratospheres. So I will explain it later on what kind of technology we have developed for these balloons. So there are different types of balloons one can use for scientific experiments or even for commercial applications. So these are called zero pressure balloons. Then there are high altitude balloons. Then these are called sounding balloons. And these sounding balloons are generally used for measuring the wind profiles or atmospheric science experiment. And uh, most of the sounding balloons are used uh, before the rocket launch. For example, like uh, ISRO, when they are flying their rocket from Satish Dhawan Shahar station, they generally use our sounding balloons before launch of a rocket so that they want to see the atmosphere conditions are favorable for rocket drone. So these are very important. That's why the name sound comes uh, because it measures the wind profile. Then these are the tethered balloons, which are basically controlled by the tether, and they are used for uh, uh, commercial applications or to understand the nearby Earth atmosphere. And then also there are special balloons which are used by ISRO uh, for zero gravity test. I will show you some examples. So this is just a quick uh, glance of the balloons which uh, we have developed in last many years. Uh, so for example, these zero pressure balloons can carry a very heavy payload up to the weight of 1200 kg up to the height of 32 kilometers. And these are generally used for astronomy, atmospheric science and engineering payloads. And then there are tropospheric balloons, then there are sounding balloons. Generally, they are lighter. Uh, they can carry weight up to 5 kg to 150 kg. These are the payload weight and they can go up to 47 kilometer. And depending where of the weight, uh, height is uh, defined. And then there are uh, special balloons. Uh, now we have developed. Uh, these are carries really very heavy payload up to 410, which can go up to 14 kilometer. And generally, these balloons are now used for space tourism, like long duration manned flight, or you can send men into the space. So these are now very popular in US and other like Spain and other countries where space tourism is becoming very important by sending uh, people to the uh, stratosphere atmosphere by these special balloons. Uh, for a couple of days and then they go and they come back. So, so balloon has now not only application in science, but also in the commercial applications. Okay, so just to give you some idea about the zero pressure balloons. So these zero pressure balloons are basically made by the polythene, a special design polythene with, with special resins are used. Uh, you can see their thickness is very quite small, like 12 to 25 micrometer. And uh, basically, uh, these uh, zero pressure balloons are developed based on the requirement of the experimenters. Um, uh, basically, two are two important requirements are there. First is the instrument weight and the required ceiling altitude. At what altitude you want to fly your balloons? So basically, this volume of the balloon is important aspect, which depends on the ceiling altitude and the total suspended load. And uh, so just to give you some example, like the uh, largest balloon which we have developed so far is uh, has a volume of 740,000 cubic meter. It's really a huge balloon which can carry with payload, suspended payload of 600 kg to 800 kg and it can go up to 43 kilometer. And we have flown this balloon for let's say maximum of 8 kilometer float altitude. So you can do that experiment up to 8, uh, eight hours. And these are generally used for X-rays. And then we have another heaviest payload, which we fly, uh, is called Far Infrared 100 Centimeter Telescope. Uh, this is the experiment which I work on. And generally, these experiments are done at the height of 32 kilometer. And uh, we can fly up to six, kilo, six hours to eight hours. And uh, in the right, you can see that uh, these are the zero pressure balloons. And this is the balloon at the inflation stage. So generally we are using hydrogen gas uh, as a carrier, as a gas for balloon. And you can see that balloon just before the launch looks like that, which is the inflation stage. We do not fill all the gas in the balloon because once balloon reaches at the ceiling altitude, for example, 43 kilometer or 32 kilometer, uh, since the air cools and pressure decreases, it expands. So it takes the total shape of the 
the balloon like one football ground. So this is the balloon which, which looks like at the ceiling altitude, it is at just the inflation stage. And this uh, experiment which we do, this float duration is basically defined by the corridor given to us. So for example, Hyderabad is here from where we fly the balloon and we have a corridor given by the DGCA or AT, AT, ATC airport traffic controller uh, is of the order of 500 kilometer by 500 kilometer. So because of that corridor, we can fly balloon up to eight to 10 hours. Of course, this balloon float duration depends on the speed of the the upper atmosphere wind speed and if it, wind speed is slow one can fly for a longer durations however if the speed is quite high then one can has a, a restriction because of this corridor given by the atc so that's why this float duration however these balloons can be used for many days zero pressure balloons like we have tested these balloons from abroad for 48 to uh, 60 hours and so on then uh, there comes a high altitude balloons these are the balloons uh, which are basically uh, designed to go up to the mesosphere. So one can you can see here these are made by very thin plastic which are of the thickness of 3.8 microns. So you can imagine it's much much thinner than the thickness of the human hair. So it's very difficult to uh, basically. Uh, use this polythene to design. One has to be very careful in your technology when you are designing these balloons. And uh, the, the basic idea is that if you have a self weight of the balloon is less, you can go much in my, higher altitude. So that's why you need a thinner plastic to develop these balloons to go much higher. And uh, uh, actually we have our world record of reaching a height of 51.8 kilometer uh, in the mesosphere. And it really opens a new area of scientists to do the uh, scientific activities or atmospheric science activities at the mesosphere. And uh, if some of you are interested, this work is published in this journal, uh, journal of Astronomical Instrumentation in 2014. And only two other countries which have reached in the mesosphere, one is US, another is Japan. And uh, of course, our uh, balloon experiment actually carried much higher payload of, uh, of the order of 10, 10 kg. Then these are the sounding balloons. Uh, so these sounding balloons are basically major a, uh, a scope is to measure the vertical wind profiles. However, these balloons are also used for atmospheric science uh, activities like measuring pressures. Uh, you, for example, you can measure the ozone concentration, you can measure temperature, relative humidity and wind speed. And uh, these are generally the important parameter in atmospheric science. But as I mentioned earlier, these are the important balloons just before the rocket launch or satellite launch because one has to see the ideal conditions and uh, these ideal atmospheric conditions are seen by the sounding balloons. So that's why the name sounding comes uh, because of the wind measurement. Then these are the teetered balloons and generally these are called kytoons also. And these are, as the name suggests, they are controlled by the teeter by, you can see one of the teeter here, controlled by the uh, launch wheeler here. And uh, these are basically aerodynamical safe balloons with, which have a fin and provide a relative uh, uh, platform. But these balloons are cannot be flown at the higher altitude. They can go up to one kilometer to two kilometer. Uh, and uh, these are very important uh, for doing any uh, test flights. Like if you are to measure, uh, test your electronics packages in airborne conditions, or you want to study the near earth atmosphere, which are we call the boundary layers of earth. Uh, these are these are the important balloons uh, on the other hand these uh, these kind of uh, teether balloons are also used for in situ measurements for example one of the activities which we done in this uh, uh, ship uh, which was uh, going in the bay of bengal and they wanted to measure the monsoon dynamics parameter using this teether balloon in the bay of bengal so that's why you can carry this balloon and measure the in situ uh, measurements there then teether balloons also come in other natural shape. Uh, natural shape means which have like a zero pressure balloon shape. And generally these are used in commercial applications. Um, uh, for example, one of the application which Tata has used Tata Tele services to test their 3G, 3G and 4G devices. So these balloons are very important uh, for such kind of test when they fly, uh, where basically these balloons are flown at different places 
uh, at different heights and then one can actually test the communication devices and they, they are become very popular now for example google company called google loon has used these uh, communication devices using balloons in the remote part of africa and uh, other countries and uh, and uh, there are huge uh, commercial applications particularly in communication using these balloons as a platform then there are we also develop very special balloons and one of them is that uh, there are a lot of demands now to do the uh, experiment in the troposphere uh, region of the atmosphere however there is a big problem in troposphere because of this temperature inversion for example troposphere is around 10 to 20 kilometers so when you go here temperature goes minus 80 degree and then normal plastic can get, become a brittle and balloon can burst but we have actually designed a special plastic which can go up to this height uh, and we can float two to four hours and now this is a very routine experiment which are done in uh, uh, from balloon facilities and this is an experiment between NASA, ISRO, and TIFR balloon facilities to particularly to understand the troposphere uh, uh, region uh, and the monsoon dynamics in the Asian regions. And then there are special balloons. Uh, these special balloons are actually developed for ISRO. And let me just you give you some example. For example, these special balloons, uh, which are like a pumpkin shape or oblate shape or sphere shape. These are called in different names. And one of them is used to test this rover, which was actually flown in Chandrayaan 2 uh, for Chandrayaan. Uh, for example, this is a rover mobility test. And these are very important. These balloons are very important, particularly to test the close to zero gravity test. Uh, so so, so because once you lift the balloon, there's not much pressure on it and it can be act as a like a zero gravity test devices. And one of the experiment was done to test the rover mobility for Chandrayaan experiment by ISRO. And another experiment was done to test the how to deploy the antenna once you, you are in the orbit. Uh, so this test was done by these balloons and they give a very good platform to uh, test the zero g, uh, g, g conditions in the lab. Uh, of ISROs. And this is one example which was used in geostony satellite, for example, GSET 31, where they wanted to use uh, an antennas uh, which are uh, uh, 360 degrees antennas and uh, uh, how to deploy antenna, what you reach to the desired altitude. And this was tested by balloons and it was successfully actually released on 6th February 2019 by GSET. So, this is another example where these special balloons are used. So these bell, balloons actually, which we develop and the scientific experiments are used by many national and international uh, scientists. Uh, there are many national collaborations are there from um, ISRO or from uh, other universities and laboratories, but there are many international collaborations which are now using our balloons for uh, commercial applications. So I will give you some example. I will show some example later in my talk. Uh, okay. So, uh, so just to mention uh, uh, one aspect that uh, since 1969, we have been doing the zero pressure uh, scientific experiment and one of the milestones which we received, uh, achieved was in 2018 when we uh, basically launched the 500 uh, basically uh, zero pressure balloon launch and it was a really a milestone for balloon facilities and, and uh, actually this was actually uh, uh, published in a current science uh, as a journal article. If some of you are interested, you can go to this article, which gives a nice history of balloon facilities and how we had achieved this milestone of launching uh, 500 balloon flight using zero pressure balloon. So apart from the balloons, of course, uh, we, we do, uh, there are many other uh, uh, balloon support instrumentation are used to have a successful balloon flight. So I will just give you some example here. For example, uh, one of the experiment which we are doing in balloon facilities like far infrared experiment, which is the heaviest payload right now, like 1200 kg. So you can see that uh, uh, this is the total uh, 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 scope of the balloon experiment. You can see balloon here, which is used as a carrier and payload is here, which is your scientific payload. And it is basically coupled with the 
a load line and uh, which is this rope here and in the, in the load line you can see there are many many instruments used like pyro cutters are used to, uh, basically to cut the balloon once experiments are done at the stratosphere so that you can detach the balloon and recover your pay payload otherwise balloon can fall on the uh, your payload and there is a free fall so these pyro cutters are used then parachutes are used to drag the balloon uh, uh, during the recovery uh, recovery particularly your science payload then a lot of gps radio sondes are used for communication applications to find the location of the balloons uh, blinkers are used to uh, give a signal to the atc and the pilots when they are flying the commercial uh, aircrafts and uh, there are many uh, uh, packages are used like telecommand and timer and antennas and these are used for communication devices from your control room on the ground to the balloon so you can see the total length of this experiment is like almost like a 200 meter so it's a huge experiment and uh, this load line is of the order of one centimeter 170 uh, meters and so on so these are the very important uh, devices and we do a lot of safeties. Uh, safety is one of the important aspect in these devices. And one of the, uh, uh, the safety devices is called the ballast cane. So let me explain you that uh, when you launch the balloon, generally the ascent rate of our balloon is roughly like 250 meter uh, per minute. And we have to maintain this ascent rate. However, as I explained you earlier, when you go the different part of the atmosphere, there are temperature changes and pressure changes. And particularly the notorious part is the troposphere where uh, there is a sudden change, temperature inversion and temperature go up to minus 80 degrees centigrade and when it happens when balloon passes this area suddenly the it, it, it encounters cooler upper, uh, upper air and uh, the lifting gas cools and then the ascent rate drops drastically from 250 meter per minute to the low, lower values and then this is the very important aspect when you have to just try to pass your balloon through the troposphere so why the way we do it is by using the ballast cane at the lower area of the payload and this ballast cane basically contains the iron shorts, uh, shorts of 1 mm diameter so there uh, we generally carry like 200 to 250 kg of this iron powders and then we release this iron powder with the rate of let's say 5 second per kg so that the weight of the total payload decreases and suddenly it gets the push and passes the troposphere in a very quick time so we, one has to be do, doing this in a very quick uh, time so that it doesn't passes uh, um, uh, troposphere or doesn't stay for a longer duration otherwise there are a chance of balloon bus because the plastic can be, become brittle so this is one of the safety devices are used in zero pressure balloons the other safety devices are basically uh, the atc devices basically in every experiment uh, 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 we use the ACT transponders and these are particularly used to, to communicate with the uh, commercial pilots who are using the aer aeroplanes and uh, generally in the air traffic control uh, in the airport so that one can has a uh, uh, radar uh, uh, continuously operating. So when we fly the balloon, we have our own ATC transponder with a unique code given to TI for balloon facilities. And this code is basically communicated to the ATC and pilots so that uh, uh, pilots know the position of balloon up to 50,000 feet during ascent and descent. So this is very important, one of the uh, safety devices. And then finally, uh, all these payloads are very, very important. They are very costly. In detectors are very costly and uh, there are many important devices. So one has to recover it 100% successfully. So for that, we have actually has a mobile tracking system, which we have developed in house, which is called GSM G GPS system. So, so this is just to one example where when once we fly the balloon balloon goes ascends like this and immediately some of the advanced party with these devices like gsm gfs they follow the balloons they are always in touch with the control room from where the balloons are controlled and balloons and payloads are controlled and generally they get the location of the balloon at uh, different positions and at the time of balloon when we cut the balloon and recover our balloon generally they reaches to that place very quickly because of these devices 
uh, where you can get the location and the SMS from the device. And generally, um, if recovery is good within half a kilometer uh, area, uh, they, they are always be reaching there if the area is safe and so on. So, so this is one of the important aspect because recovery is important because if it falls to some places where sometimes we have a problem with villagers and so on, so one has to recover very uh, quickly there. To, so that you can recover your at least main payload and instruments. Okay, so the last aspect of balloon instrumentation is of course uh, communication devices. So we are using a S band telecommand and telemetry. So basically, this is operated at uh, two mega two gigahertz. So we have a uplink which are generally used for controlling the telecommand so that you command your payload and so it is like a telecommand you used in satellites and then we have a downlink which operates in another frequency and these downlinks are used to get the data from the balloons and generally you need a quick loop data or health parameters of the balloon so that you online you can assess the performance of the balloon and then online you can take a decision that how to operate the payload and so on so so this s band telecommand and telemetry system is very important which is shown here uh, which are used in the control room and some of the glimpses of this ir for particularly this one of the experiment uh, so sometimes we have a nice uh, this recovery is very good for example it falls in a plain land but sometime it recovery is very tough when it falls in a dense forest so so it it can happen that uh, it can fall in a tough places also and uh, of course so far we have done 100% uh, recovery uh, so so generally as i explain you that uh, uh, when it falls to the ground basically it was uh, dragged by the parachute so so what happens once you cut the balloon at the stratosphere, let's say 40 kilometer, then uh, balloon falls and uh, then there is a free fall up to 10 kilometer and at the 10 kilometer this parachute opens, which carries the payload to the ground. So you can see here in one of the recovery, this is the parachute and this is the payload and uh, that's why you get the safe recovery and uh, and these instruments are made such that there are a lot of shock absorber around this instrument so that the inner uh, instrument remains safe and out body gets damaged, which can be uh, actually <clears throat> refurbished later uh, for the new experiment. Now I'll come to that, uh, some of the research area where these balloons are used. So we have been using these balloons for space astronomy like infrared and x-rays. Now a lot of activities is going on atmospheric sciences. There are a lot of uh, programs of national importance now to understand the monsoon dynamics in Indian and Asian regions. So there are many such experiments which are done by ISRO and other scientists from abroad. Uh, so I will give you some examples of them. Then now this uh, ballooning has now reached to the commercial applications, particularly uh, people are using for high altitude human space drive. I will show you one example. Now these balloons are used for world tool for long duration flying. Space tourism is going to be one of the important aspects where you can go with balloon in space and come back after weekend and so on. And this already has started in US. Then communication is one of the really important aspect of balloon, particularly uh, these communication can be used when you have a natural disasters uh, where when uh, you don't have electricity and other things. So one can use these balloons with battery operated devices. And this has been used in like Kumbh Mela and other places um, by uh, uh, scientists in India. So uh, just to give you a quick example of these uh, balloons, particularly next uh, X-ray astronomy, these balloons were used a long time back. It started in 1967 when uh, first X-ray astronomy payload was used, sodium iodide scintillation counter. And then a lot of uh, advancement happened in X-ray technology. And then large area scintillation counters were launched from 1997 to 2011. And uh, in 2008, uh, the, these large area X-ray proportional counters, which were flown in Estosat on 28 September 2015, were actually flight tested first in balloons uh, from TIFR balloon facilities. And once they were flight tested, uh, these Lex PC devices uh, instruments, they were then used in Estosat, uh, which was India's multi-wavelength astronomy satellite. Uh, launched in 2015. And so once this S2 set was loose, you uh, launched, then uh, we didn't have uh, regular X ray exp ex uh, activities. However, we have a regular uh, activities on far infrared astronomy where we have our own instrument, which is a 100 centimeter telescope, which is called balloon bound far infrared telescope. 
and uh, this telescope has been launched since 26 times since 1983 so you can imagine that each time we have a um, um, recovery which was quite safe and uh, generally these experiments are done uh, to map the star forming region where the stars are forming you have a gas and dust uh, around uh, beyond 100 microns so right now we are using this telescope uh, particularly to explore one of the important line in the interstellar medium in star forming region which is called c2 line singly ionized carbon line which falls at 158 micron so of course hydrogen is the most abundant element in the interstellar medium but it's very difficult to observe because there are no direct transitions and the next abundant gas is of course carbon which has a less ionization potential uh, potential so you one can easily observe the carbon gas and uh, this is used by uh, particularly the device which we use is called fabry perot spectrometer which is tuned uh, it uses a stressed Germany gallium devices. So once you stress your photoconductor, uh, you can actually increase your operating wavelength so that uh, we can operate at 158 micron, which is basically the center wavelength of carbon line. And uh, this uh, uh, instrument has been, uh, particularly right now, we can do the spectral resolution uh, scanning mapping of star forming region with a resolution of 1700, which is roughly 175 kilometer per second. So you can study the dynamics of the star forming region or gas dynamics and so on so this experiment is very important for um, uh, study the star forming region so this is some, one, one example and one of the most important aspect of balloon experiment as compared to satellite experiment is that one can actually use the large area of the star forming region which is of course not possible with the satellite experiment generally with satellite one can do the pointed observations so that is one of the most important important advantage of balloon so for example one can see here one of the star forming region in our milky way where which has been mapped from 30 arc minute by 15 arc minute area almost like a half degree area uh, in one experiment so that is the beauty of balloon experiment and uh, this is just to show you one uh, volume of this experiment like ti 400 centimeter so, so this is the balloon and this is the payload so total length of this load line is almost like 200 meter and these are the electronics packages which i explained earlier different packages and these packages are airborne by the, these pilot balloons so that once this balloon is launched it comes like this so that uh, sorry Sorry, I'm okay. Okay, so once this balloon is launched, uh, uh, these packets should not hit the ground so that these pilot balloons are used. And uh, this is the way the balloon takes. If time permits, I will show you the movie about this balloon launch. Okay, the next balloon experiments, uh, which have been done by the Indian Institute of Geomagnetism, are particularly to study the electrodynamics in the low altitude Earth atmosphere. So generally, these weak horizontal electric fields are not known very well in stratosphere uh, altitude. So this is called Beans experiment, and this is the first experiment uh, in India, and of course in the world also. Very few su such experiments were done where these. Uh, uh, electric fields were measured in the earth atmosphere which are very weak so one has to go to the higher the altitude and measure these electric fields to understand the dynamics of the atmosphere which are important to understand the other aspect of the atmosphere like monsoon dynamics and so on and then the one of the very important we also encourage a lot of students and this is one of the experiment which was basically india's first student near space experiment done by bits plani goa campus student and this very nice experiment where these students they wanted to study the uh, the uh, to assess the biological harmful radiation coming from due to the cosmic rays and the idea was that when pilots are flying uh, like pilots and crew members uh, for long durations they have always a uh, uh, a problem with these cosmic rays, the cosmic radiations, and they are very harmful uh, if they are exposed for long duration due, during their aviation services. So they have done this experiment using balloons by launching these different devices. And actually, they have patented this device now, and it is, has been also published 
uh, in one of the uh, uh, open uh, access archive, uh, which is shown here. So this is one of the very nice experiments were done balloons. And in atmospheric science studies, we have many balloon devices which are located in balloon facilities like optical, particle counter, quartz kits for balance, and so on. Also, these devices are used for balloons to uh, do many experiments in atmospheric lines. So one of the important experiment which is currently going on and it will um, basically end in 2024 is called balloon campaign to study Asian proposed aerosol layers. So these aerosols are the dust particles uh, which are very harmful for monsoons. Uh, particularly these are the main main uh, 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 pollution uh, particle which go to the higher altitude and this is a co collaboration between NASA, ISRO and TFR balloon facilities where they want, want to measure the aerosol optical properties, their size distribution, chemical composition to understand the uh, monsoon pattern. Uh, in the Asian and Indian region and this is has been going and this experiment by the way is done during monsoon season which is the toughest time to launch balloons because of the adverse conditions but nevertheless many balloons have been done uh, from since 2015 and uh, they have got very good results then another experiment is called to measure the black carbon aerosols at the uh, 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 troposphere altitude. So these black carbons are again the pollution, uh, main main pollutions because of the petrol and diesel and so on. And they also affect, affect the monsoons uh, dynamics and pattern and so on. So this is the experiment done by ISRO unit space physics laboratory in Tiruvannamalai, where they measure the black carbon uh, uh, and study this uh, their implications in the monsoon. Then another experiment which was done by uh, another unit of ISRO to measure the ozone concentration. So the ozone uh, basically to see the greenhouse effect and so on. So this is one example uh, with balloon, you go to the higher altitude and you measure the ozone concentration and study how it is changing, how it is variable and harmful uh, for uh, other applications or monsoons and so on. And then in another example of uh, uh, example of this monsoon experiment is using tropical tropopause dynamics where again they are measuring the water vapor and ozone in upper troposphere and stratosphere and these are done by the rubber balloons the earlier experiments are done by the zero pressure balloons but these are done by rubber balloons and which can go much higher altitude and so you can explore much higher altitude of the atmosphere and these are all the experiments which are still ongoing and then finally, Indian Institute of Geomagnetism in Pune, in collaboration with many places in India, have done these rubber balloons to study the uh, cloud aerosol interactions uh, and precipitation enhanced experiment, which is called Kaipix experiment of Indian Institute of Geomagnetism. Again, it is uh, done for the monsoon studies and they get the data and model predictions for the future uh, monsoon uh, pattern and so on. So this is again an ongoing activities using balloons. And finally, commercial applications, uh, balloons are used for very crazy ideas. So this is one of the uh, balloon experiment using our own balloon was done by a former Google executive whose name was Alan Hustas, uh, who basically went with the balloon up to the height of 42 kilometer, 41.42 to precisely, and then he made a sky dive. So this is the world record of the uh, high altitude jumping uh, from 41.42 to 2 kilometer. So he went with the zero pressure balloon made by TFR balloon facilities up to this height and then he jumped from there to just to make the world record. Of course, the earlier uh, world record was broken and uh, this experiment are still going on to make a, a world record for even for higher altitude. So these balloons are used for such commercial application. Then another important application of these balloons in to develop the space capsule where they can basically take uh, humans for uh, uh, space tourism. So one of the experiment was done by Singaporean, one of the scientists, where he ex actually tests the space capsule, uh, which they want to send to first Singaporean, and they tested with the live rats. Uh, so this first time these animals were launched from India in balloons, and uh, they test uh, tested these rats condition uh, once the balloon were recovered and uh, they, then they made these space capsules and now these space capsules are actually flown using our balloons from Australia uh, where they are uh, basically sending the uh, humans 
from Singapore to uh, do for the space tourism. Then the, the most important application of balloon, as I explained, is on communications, particularly like wireless communication and so on. So the center of uh, Department of Telemetrics in India is actually using our balloons, tethered balloons, to study, uh, basically to explore the 5G devices, and uh, they are continuously working on it, where they fly the balloon at different places, and then they test their communication devices. And not only that, these uh, balloons can also be used as a last mile communication solution for, ne for during the na natural disaster like earthquakes, floods, and landslides. And also there are strategic application of these devices where defense are using these devices from balloons to particularly to uh, probe the drones if they are coming from borders and they have been, they want to see uh, by using balloons at lower altitude that uh, if there are any drone, drone which is coming to India and so on. So defense are also quite uh, uh, interesting to use this balloon for strategic applications. So, so these are the future plans of balloon facilities. Uh, I explain about TIFR experiment and other experiment for other laboratories and uh, 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 international laboratories. But now these balloons are used for climate applications, not only climate studies, but now mitigation of the climate change mitigation experiments are very important. How to mitigate the climate and make uh, uh, these balloons as an application. Then commercial aspect, there are internet and mobile communication is one of the devices where balloons will be used. Space tourism and space exploration is becoming very important and long duration manned flights are very important. And for that, we are actually now doing a lot of R&D activities. And so far I talked about zero pressure balloons, but now we are developing a super pressure balloons, which are called hybrid stato super pressure balloons for long duration flight because zero pressure balloons cannot be used for for months and so on, but the super pressure balloons are important where they you can fly such balloons for months and uh, several months. And uh, we are developing these devices at the same time. Zero pressure balloons to carry even heavier payload. Right now we have developed for 4,000 kgs, but our goal is to develop it for. Uh, 6.5 ton payload and with because these capsules which are generally used for manned flights are of the order of this weight and that is what we are right now developing this thing so i have a movie of uh, 10 to 11 minutes uh, so mayuk if you have time i can show you this movie uh, yes i think we are fine okay okay yeah so okay so i am starting this movie so Uh, Professor Ocean, does this movie have yes. audio? Uh, the audio is not. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, we can't hear the audio. Does this movie have audio? Uh, yeah, actually, it is using a laptop thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have not put the, the audio devices. So using the laptop audio also. Okay, okay. So please go ahead. Okay, so so this is movies also in YouTube. So maybe uh, if uh, I will send you the YouTube link, so that may be better. So maybe I will go to the next clip. So the, um, uh, maybe this one is I don't know. There may be or this is again the YouTube movie. But let us just see. This is the sky jump thing. Okay. 
So then I'm going to get this one back here. Okay, so maybe I, I can stop here. So if you have questions, I can. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Vatan. And it's very illuminating and very detailed information about the balloon facility and the experiments going on. So I I hope we will have still have questions. So, first of all, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, can we use more than one balloon uh, for this uh, uh, like experiment, like uh, to increase the payload? And if yes, we can use them, can we go to 2, 3, 4, and what is the limit and uh, why? Uh, yeah, so we have not see these larger balloons, uh, we have not yet launched. Uh, uh, basically, we launch a single balloons because it's a huge experiment, but there are such um, applications which are coming uh, from other experiments where uh, uh, we can launch a couple of balloons at a time, but with some time lag because uh, uh, once you launch one balloon, which is a huge effort, um, uh, but then uh, if you want to uh, launch the second balloon, you need some, let's say, 30 minutes and so on, depending on the weight of your payload and so on. So these are about the, the bigger balloons, but of course rubber balloons and uh, small volume balloons can be launched uh, multiple balloons at a time. Yeah. So does it answer your question? Uh, any other question? Uh, okay, Professor Vajra, I have one question. Yes, yes, please. It will be useful for students. Let's say if the students or the faculty do, they have any small detectors and they want to do experiments using the bedroom facilities. What is the procedure uh, to approach or to do these experiments? Can you briefly tell us? Yeah, so we have a proposal based system. So uh, generally, uh, uh, the requirements which uh, you have, you can actually write in your proposal, which are available on TI for balloon facility web page. And uh, so basically, main important requirements is uh, a weight, what is the uh, total weight of your payload. And so basically, this weight defines the, uh, the, the volume of the balloon which we design. So once you can tell us what is the payload weight and so on, and what is the idea of our experiment. So accordingly, the balloon can be designed. And uh, so this is one way to do one experiment. But in the same time, sometimes we have a regular launches. And if your payloads are small, and you want to test some of the devices and so on. So we, these uh, devices can go on as a carrier on those kind of experiment, other experiments where we have a bigger experiment and they can be used as a like a, a loss rocket launch. You have multiple satellites, a small, a small nano satellites. So similar thing can be done for a bigger launch thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so if Okay, so one question. Yeah. Hello, sir. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Sir, once you said that a specific value can use for the identity test. So how can we like could you please some details about that? How can we do the gravity test test about that value? Uh, you my your question is about the reuse of balloon or 
Yes, sir. How can we check that zero gravity test about using these specific values? Yeah, so these are not closely zero G gravity, but what happens that, uh, uh, so basically one of the important aspect in balloon is that uh, lift gas. So, so generally we use hydrogen gas. Unfortunately, we don't have, a, I mean, helium gas is generally used in balloon, but which is very costly. So, so this lift gas defines the, the total pressure it exerts when balloon are launched. So what happens that like I showed the ISRO experiment like rover uh, uh, rover test or uh, in antenna deployment test. So these are tacked behind below the balloon uh, with a rope, and uh, so so we calculate uh, what is the payload weight, and with accordingly we calculate aerodynamically what is the volume of the lift gas is needed and how much pressure it can exert. So once we release the balloon, the total lift of the balloon, uh, which you can measure in terms of pressure, is comes close to the zero G gravity. So that is kind of uh, no, simulations for close to zero G. It's not really G equal to zero. So th that is where, so, so most important aspect in the experiment is the lift gas calculations. Okay, so if not, thanks, Professor Oja. Uh, and I hope that uh, someday you could make a trip to the Hyderabad Balloon facility when you will be conducting some of those experiments so that the students here can go and have a look by themselves, like how we are actually doing the balloon experiments and hopefully yes, that will embarrass them too. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And yes, um, thank you. Yeah. So thank you. We, and do this session by thanking both uh, speakers, and then we conduct the next sessions after that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, and also, now we'll be waiting for lunch. Uh, and the lunch will be served on the 6th floor of the same building. So, that I just have a few announcements. So, from 2 to 3.30, there will be a technical poster presentation session. It will be right outside the auditorium. Uh, there will be the three boards. Uh, so, uh, to be